This is probably going to be more detailed than any reasonable person would want, but also not detailed enough for some. And that's because I'm not going to give you an exact feat list 1 through 20. In fact, this guide will only really go up to level 8 and show guidelines and the way of thinking. It will have an exact build for levels 1 and 2, but it will not tell you pick exactly these feats in this order in order to beat the game. That's not possible. Because as much as I can highlight the math and highlight some very strong strategies and a character that can do almost everything as well as a specialist of that category, I still will not be able to tell you which feat exactly is best for your campaign. But I will tell you how to evaluate those. And I think you're going to really like this guide. It pulls upon a lot of the ideas I mentioned in all my previous general guides, so I will be constantly referencing other videos on my channel, which you can go find. YouTube will only let me put three eye icons in the top right of the screen, so some things won't have an eye icon for that reason. I simply do not have enough ways to reference myself. So, with that out of the way, let's just go ahead and get started. Also, I've just now started the Join Members program. So you can go down there and click join to get access to videos like this one at least 24 hours before they go live to everyone else. This only applies to my major Pathfinder guides. I'm going to try and produce weekly from now on. But the stuff that I make for fun that I think will bomb, I I I'm just going to release that when it's done. So the best character. What does this mean? Let's take a look at our roles from the previous video I just announced made and I'm going to use this as one of the few eye icons because it's worth it. And I basically went over all these roles are things that exist within a party. You have a bunch of things for damage, a bunch of things for non-damage things, and out of combat stuff that you'd want to do. This build covers everything that is highlighted in green and then can do everything that's highlighted in orange. You might notice, wait, that's almost all of them. Because, yeah, you're still limited by the amount of skills you have. That is the only limitation I haven't found a way to bend. This will be nutty. You can see here, I am saying that it isn't as great on the damage side of things. But it can still hit multi-target. It can still target different defenses. And then in terms of the healing, perfect healing. It can manipulate the action economy. It has a great buffs and debuffs, and it can off tank, or main tank even. Then for its out of combat rules, oh yeah, it's going to be a spellcaster. How? What am I on about? And, well, let's start with the class, because that's one of the most basic things to start with. It's the thing that determines everything else about your kit. So I want something with spellcasting, I want something with armor, basically everything else can be negotiable but I really wanted to have spellcasting and armor so I could do grappling. Because the thing about all the grapple maneuvers is how fast you can tick up athletics to legendary is not dependent on your class. Everybody goes trained at 1, expert 3, master 7, legendary 15. That's true if you're a caster, if you're a marshal, if you're a rogue. None of it matters. Everybody upgrade skills at around the same time. So, because of that, a caster can be a great grappler. And grapples are, and trips, pretty strong debuffs. So, I really narrowed it down to druid and war priest because those are the casters that get medium armor naturally. Druids will have better damage spells, shape-shifting abilities, combat grab while transformed, and other useful focus spells, like the one that can give people a massive amount of clumsy if they fail a save. Cleric has healing font, so they're just going to have a bunch of extra heals per day for no good reason. Access to bless, which is ridiculously big post remaster. Access to athletic rush to actually get a status bonus to push athletics even higher. And boost your fist damage through a deity choice. So we're going to go with War Priest. And for that deity, we have some requirements that are pretty strict. We need them to have access to the Might Domain so we can get Athletic Rush. We need a fist-favored weapon, because we're gonna need a human for the amount of feats we want. 
the D6 strike from the simple weapon is going to be pretty important. And the anathema must not interfere with just being a character. Everything else can be negotiable. So as such, we land on a Rory. And you can look at it. Okay, so Harmer Heal, Divine Font. Any sanctification. So already it can work in undead parties if you need it to. Skill Athletics. Sure, so we're not wasting a skill on something we don't need. Favor Weapon Fist. Perfect. Domain. Has Might in there. Perfect. Spells aren't the best, but... You know, Haste is fine. It So, like... Everything above the spells is exactly what we were looking for. So, as such, we're just going to take Aurora and run with it. Now, we can actually begin building our character. So, let's start the Ancestry, the ABCs. We had to skip to class first because, you know, human. And we need to be human or half-human because we need to immediately get natural ambition to get Athletic Rush as early as possible. We need to get as soon as possible by going natural ambition into Deity Domain, into Might Domain, which requires us to have the Deity from before. So, yes, we actually need to talk about everything in that order to even start explaining Level 1. And Athletic Rush, for those of you that don't know, is single action, lets you stride, leap, climb, or swim while doing it, to, while giving you a plus 10 bonus to speed and plus 2 to athletics checks for one round. This means you can get plus two to athletics checks and go for a trip or go for a grapple. And if you do go for that grapple and it works, your escape DC also has that plus two bonus because one round, that only goes away at the start of your next turn. So your escape DC is also plus two compared to where it normally is. And for your background, I say you go field medic or once bitten. It's personal preference of what lore you want. I personally prefer warfare lore on my clerics because... Well, I'm already going to be having religion automatically, and that covers all the undead already, and my wisdom would be higher than my int. So, I don't really think you'll get much use out of undead lore as a cleric in specific. So, I'd go with warfare lore because it overlaps with society, which you're not likely to have a good society on this character. So, as such, field medic, we're just going to slam that down because... Battle Medicine is an absurd skill feat, and you'll see why in my explanations later. Because Battle Medicine, as a single action, lets you just do the treat wounds thing. You can just heal people for a single action. No spell slots, and if you have four people in the party, that's four more heals you're carrying around, in addition to the four you have from just being a cleric at level one. So you're carrying eight heals at level one. Eight of them! You can heal eight times. How is this fair? I'm not quite sure yet. And also, Battle Medicine in Post Remaster, you might notice, it no longer has requirement, has an open hand. But that's just because it was put into the Healer's Toolkit as a requirement of hands one or two that you can see there. And also, if you're looking to get the Healer's Toolkit expanded, it doesn't actually work with Battle Medicine rules as written because it specifically lists out all of these activities here as things that the toolkit does and the expand version says plus one item bonus to such checks which battle medicine is not listed in those basic activities so rules as written it doesn't buff battle medicine which gms are free to house rule that i'm just saying that's how the rules are worded i'm not saying that i agree with it um but that's how they're worded. So for start equipment, this is also going to get a little wacky. We're going to start with chainmail armor. We don't care about the noisy trait, and it gives us two gold pieces compared to the breastplate. And yes, we are going to be spending all of that. <laughs> so we're going to get healer's toolkit for another five gold pieces. So we're already 11 in the hole. We have four left. And the healer's toolkit is needed for the treat wounds and battle medicine. Because we're also the out-of-combat healer. Because, you know, we don't have enough healing on this character yet. And then we have the adventurer's pack, which includes our rope, our basic rations, everything else. Just get all that out of the way. It's all one purchase. We just don't think about it anymore. Then we also need a steel shield, uh, which is another two gold pieces down the hole. 
And now we have five left. Um, you have shield block as a cleric. So I'd, I'd recommend getting the steel shield. Shield blocking is pretty useful early game. So having a better shield early is just nice. And technically, and this is a big technically, with the fist unarmed strike, you can do that with any part of your body. So for the purposes of combat grab, you can actually headbutt and keep an open hand the entire time. So you can technically meet the requirements of combat grab. And also, if you really do a reading combat grab, it's you make a strike while keeping a hand open. And, you know, you you, you just slap them and then you, your hand has been open the entire time. I'm just saying. Um, so you can actually do the steel shield and still make combat grab work with unarmed strikes. There are a few arguments for doing that. Uh, it's optimal to have somebody else help you repair this one. Because you want to spend all your out of combat time either treating wounds or refocusing. And... You might be able to refocus while treating wounds if your GM is nice, but I would not count on that personally. Ronald, the rules lawyer, lets me do it, but um, that's just because refocusing is if you're doing something that better aligns you with your deity, and it's kind of debatable if that includes medicine for a Rory, but it is something that you heavily practice and you're trying to master, and Rory is about the pursuit of mastery and knowledge, medicine can fall under that. It's vague. I'm not going to say you absolutely will be able to do it. It's just something you might be able to ask the GM for. Dagger, simply for if you need to deal the extra damage to zombies with slashing. And then you have three silver left over after all that. If this guy seems scatterbrained, it's because it is. I'm trying to lay it out, but oh man, there are a lot of tangents. So, suggested equipment that you should buy at high level. Better armor. Just get your armor potencies. If you get the... Armor proficiency, proficiency feat in Cleric. Uh, feel free to get full plate. Scrolls for all the silver bullet spells that you might want. The athletics boosting items, such as lifting belt, such as armbands of athleticism, such as the apex items when those come out. You have a searchable section on Archives of Nethys for just the item boost. Just control F athletics and just kind of scroll until you find stuff you like. And I would actually recommend delaying your striking runes for athletics boosters because your value as a character comes from your grabs, comes from your trips, not your strike damage. And you can just use spells for damage if you actually are wisdom oriented because you don't necessarily need wisdom on this build. Again, a lot of different things going on. I'll talk about them more in the stats section. You can try and get War Priest armor by four or six ish to get into that full plate. Because you're not going to have the strength prerogative for full plate until level 5 anyway. So just when you look at getting the armor potency, that's when you should look at getting your full plate. If you end up taking that feat that gives you the arm proficiency. Because, you know, the plus 5 move speed, it, it's a thing. You could choose to stay medium armor to have more move speed. That's a valid choice. And I'd still recommend getting the potency and resilience whenever possible. There's one other uncommon item I think you should look at, and that is shield augmentation. Uh, for Pathfinder Society folks, you can get this from Frequent Shopper Boon, getting Unscathed Blade, and you get 80 of these points for just joining Pathfinder Society. So if this is your first character there, that's perfectly fine. You can just kind of have this and go ahead and get shield augmentation there. And this book also includes the rest archetype. And PFS has a rule of only using stuff from books you own. So getting Grand Bazaar to then be able to use Wrestler and be able to use Shield Augmentation. Pretty good. Um, they both come from the same supplement. So there you go. What this does is you attach it to your shield. And now instead of a shield boss, you have the ability to trip and disarm using the shield's hand. So while you're grappling somebody, you still have access to trip and still have access to disarm. Which, pretty decent. And now for stat distribution, my recommended stats are as follows. Strength, because we want to have maximum strength for grapples. Dexterity, fill out the medium armor. And also, it's a saving throw, tumble throughs, trips, etc. Because even then, Bulwark will not protect us from those types of effects. Con helps with taking hits and it's a saving throw so we put a, the final plus one there and we don't really need it 
we have other people in the party to take care of int skills. Same thing with charisma. I'm suggesting for the default build, get plus four whiz as you actually have access to some pretty good damage spells in our post remaster world. Because Divine had good damage spells at higher spell ranks that could still like hurt decently well. Now you also have pretty good damage cantrips with Divine Land's spirit damage being more consistent than old school alignment damage. And stuff like Needle Darts existing if you have Rage of Elements for Pathfinder Society. So you can actually get some pretty good sustained damage and burst area damage from being a high wisdom divine caster. You can still dump wisdom two-ish if you need to cover other skills, if you have a long-term party but still want to do this build. Um, it doesn't make you that much worse because the spells are kind of a secondary option for attacking anyway. Your main goal will be still grappling with your athletic rush, going for those trips, going for those combat grabs. So... It doesn't actually hurt that much to bring Wiz down lower. It just means that you want to prioritize buff spells more and prioritize utility spells more than just the pure damage. So now suggestions for what skills to have. Mandatory, as in literally you are taking these based on the choices previously. Athletics comes from the deity. Religion comes from you are playing a cleric. And medicine comes from background. You have no say in those three skills. Those are... You're guaranteed to have them. I cannot adjust them. And then you have two more picks of the following. Nature, because it's a good wisdom recall knowledge skill. And you're a high wisdom character, so you'll naturally be good at nature after you have it trained. Crafting, to help you repair your shield. If there's nobody else willing to take crafting, you can just force everybody to watch you repair your shield. And take extra time out of the day to do that until somebody else trains it when they have an int increase. And acrobatics. So that you don't get walled by a sheet of ice on the ground. Because I have spent too many encounters on a goddamn slip and slide. I'm going to zoom in for this one. There are so many times in Ron's games where we just randomly are on a boat covered in ice. And I just end up flopping on the ground like a fool because I need to cover some charisma skills. Anyway, that's my rant over. Uh, acrobatics is very good. I'd highly recommend having some acrobatics. Um, <laughs> just because this type of encounter of, oh no, we are all fighting a thing and the floor is wacky slippery happens infrequently, but enough to be annoying for me. Um, you can boost int at level five if you want to leave decks at plus one to get the third skill that you left out of this one. And survival is rarely used, but keys off whiz. So you could look at that being used instead of, well, crafting if you already have somebody that can repair your stuff in the party. And I have some recommended spells here. Because, who? we're still getting started. You have runic weapon, runic body for early game. Because just, this can like effectively double the efficiency of target marshal. And... Doubling the efficiency of target marshal and then also being a diet marshal is you're getting a character plus worth of value from one of your six spell slots at level one because you have the four heals and you have two other spells. I just want to emphasize how many spells you have at the start of spell section. If you are playing in a game with a druid as this cleric, the druid can be spending one slotted spell per fight while you are spending two. The druid still runs out of slots first. That is how many spells you have. Do not feel like your spells are not getting that much value. Because, like, that's fine. Your spell blanks? Sure, I have five more. And even if you do somehow manage to run out of those four heals and the rest of the party is still ready to go, you just lean on your battle medicines. And you're not even going to want to cast a spell every round because you have your grapple that's so strong. You have your trip that's so strong. You have a basic strike that's passable. You have your cantrip still. So you aren't really wanting to cast loaded spells that often anyway. So you really very rarely run out of resources. And this enables you to get a little wackier with your spell picks. But at level one, I'd still recommend sticking to like uh, just the spells that are listed over here. Um, just because striking is such a powerful effect. And even if you had a party of four of you, 
I'd still recommend most of you take Runic Body and then one other person take Bless. Is that way you just surround somebody and you start trip grappling them and then the people that have the Runic Body on them just start pummeling them to death. And you're then effectively martial damage uh, except for the ones that are grappling. And everybody's a healer. So if somebody takes damage, you just heal them back up. And even in a boss fight, you know, what are they going to do about it? Th they need to have enough damage to go through all of your heal spells, which... <laughs> Good luck with that one. Um, <laughs> in combat, it's absurd. Um, this build will always be able to do stuff. And that's its greatest strength. Oh, and helpful steps. Honestly, kind of a balancing error. Um, you just make something that goes 40 feet tall. If you have a ranged character in the party, just put them at the top of the staircase. Uh, if there's an open field... Yeah, the, the, just have your gunslinger start climbing the stairs and then ask the GM, hey, is there a railing I can hide behind? Because, you know, if the sniper gunslinger is able to hide directly on the stairs, well, suddenly they have that consistent off guard and they're a happy camper because they can see all the cover on the battlefield. So, go, go gadget sniper tower as well as being a good spell for helping you get around places. Really enjoyable. Re fun. Um, you have Bless, of course, which I think is actually better than some third rank spells in the post remaster world where at start, it's a 15 foot emanation that gives all your allies plus one status bonus to attack rolls. And you don't actually need to sustain it. It just lasts the minute. But, you know, you can sustain it to increase the radius by 10 feet per. So frequently turn one, you're in the later levels, as in post everybody has striking runes you're going to be doing a bless kind of letting people fight figure out how to do that mid thing and then you athletic rush in go for the trip go for the grapple and you have the bless up so now suddenly you swing the math by plus three for every other marshal by yourself uh, from a first rank spell and if somebody takes damage you heal them that's the game plan for most single target fights uh it's gross Fear, of course, is a good early game spell. Again, I don't think it's better than Runic Weapon in the boss fights, but this is a way for you to apply a status penalty. So now you can give your party a status bonus. You can give your party a... You can give the enemy a circumstance penalty to AC. You can also give your party a status bonus. So you can swing the math by plus four, plus five by yourself pretty reasonably for your entire party using... First rank spells and grapples. Yeah, no, I, I have nothing more to say on this. You do all this. Oh, yeah, and you still have all the heals because you're a cleric. I, I don't really care that the spell league C doesn't scale as well. Um, You're great. You're, you're doing fine. There's also summon spells. I have a video on summon spells. I might put that as an I card up there if I think it's worth it. But I summons are good. Um, at least for early game. And they also enable some gimmicks. Like, uh, da, 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 Final Sacrifice. So, you have the Mindless Undead run in there. And if you're picking something like a Skeleton, that resists all the enemy's damage, potentially. And the Skeleton has outlived its usefulness. You then just blow it up and it becomes a Fireball. So you have Fireball, um, in the really janky way. You also have Sudden Blight for a more consistent area damage thing, starting at spell rank 2. Mind you, this is from Advanced Player's Guide, which blah 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 blah. I'm pretty sure that's in the Humble Bundle that's currently available. I'll need to double check, but I'm pretty sure. Like, if you're for PFS, um, Advanced Player Guide is one that tends to be in a lot of those bundles. So just check to see if you have it. This is a very potent spell. And I'm going to mention Inner Radiance Torrent, even though it's PFS restricted. For the purposes of this guide. Simply because, well. It has this Hyden. Where it increases the damage by. Doubling the base damage. Every time it ranks up. So it actually scales harder than Lightning Bolt. In terms of raw damage. Um, That's not intended. So. The game designers have said previously. That this was an error so what i say you should do is change it to a hide and plus two 
And that simply has it scale properly because it also has this extra writer effect that makes it set a uh, hide and plus one is just kind of weird. So just make it a hide and plus two and it, it still works. It's still a perfectly fine spell. You can actually get some nasty lines off of the two ash and 60 foot long version. And you can just charge it for two rounds if there are a lot of enemies that are still approaching. So I've actually found this spell to be incredibly useful, even without like the ridiculous heightening. Uh, revealing light and other silver bullet spells. You can still very much prep them because you already have a lot of generically useful spells in your heals and your first rank slots of bless. So there comes a point when you can just say, yeah, no, all my spells here are just silver bullets. I always have on hand. Because that way, if you throw a weird encounter at us, I just counter its weirdness and then do my normal strategy on top of it. And my normal strategy is so strong, it doesn't matter. Uh, <laughs> I already talked about Final Sacrifice and also Heal. Because I haven't mentioned what this spell actually does yet. Um, so you're 90% of the time going to be doing the two action version, which has the 30 foot range and heals for a D8 plus 8 per spell rank, which is great and your font spell is always going to be your maximum spell rank so you're going to be healing for like a lot pretty much having people go from near dead to near full in just two actions and enemies usually need to you know roll to hit people you just kind of don't roll to heal them so you can very easily outpace the damage of enemies as long as you have spell slots and let me tell you you will have spell slots the font of life assures it because you are going to have four extra spell slots until level five where you get an extra one and then level 15 where you get one on top of that. So it's, you get a lot of these. And then another uh, 9% of the time, you're doing the three action big burst to heal up everybody around you and also damage undead in the area. So if you're in a campaign with a lot of undead, this build actually gets better. Um... <laughs> Because it needs the help, really. Uh, and then 1% of the time you do the range of touch, which is a quick stabilization. Or you do a thing that I like to call the patty cake. Uh, where you have an undead in front of you. And you one action heal. And then you one action heal. And then you one action heal. To just do the maximum amount of damage to it. That is a thing you can do against lower fortitude undead, like skeletons. But you already do bludgeoning damage with your fist. So just, you know, punch them in the throat is my opinion. So you can go for like a punch, heal, heal. And that could be a strategy for dealing with skeletons. But I think that's a little janky, but you're free to go for it. it. You have enough heals to the point where you can start spending them on stupid things like that. And also I have example builds down the description that go up to level eight. Note the books you own if you're making it for Pathfinder Society, but yeah, there are some really neat things in the description down below. And now it's time to talk about specific scenarios. So this character's in normal party, fighter, wizard, rogue, plus you. And you're up against Horde of Goblins. So Goblin Warriors, you can see. You can deal about a D6 plus three damage on a punch. Goblins have only six HP each. So you can just participate as a normal damage character, either using needle darts, uh, divine lance, or just punching them with that D6 plus three. And if somebody gets hurt, you just spend a spell slot or a battle medicine, and suddenly they're not hurt anymore. So you can really just out sustain and use the damage of yourself and your party to then just kind of get through it with maybe at most one or two heals expended, which is still perfectly fine. And now Barghest, um, they have attack of opportunity, aka reactive strike. So they are going to bite the crap out of you if you try to cast a spell in melee range. They have pretty good fort and reflex. So what do we do against this? At level one, our athletics is only a plus eight with athletic rush. At level four, however, when this becomes an on-level creature, we have a plus 14. And both Ford and Reflex suddenly look like low saves. And I just want to say the trick is you just runic weapon the fighter. 
Now suddenly they have a magic weapon and they're just going to cleave through those 50 HP, sit back and use heals and use your damage cantrips and just help them take this thing out over time. And that's usually how you deal with it. It shouldn't be too much more of an issue. And I'd like to mention Owlbears as a boss with a weak save. They only have a reflex plus seven. So you can actually go in there, athletic rush and trip it on a nine, even at level one, which is pretty cool. Um, but when do grab strats get good? Because those numbers seem low. And well, that's because at the low levels, as you can see based on this, let me just quickly shrink my webcam so you can actually see it. You can see that the number required to succeed on the D20 is on the left. You can see the type of save bonus at the top and then the level. And you can see that at the low levels, you'll need to roll pretty high on that D20 in order to actually get your maneuver off. But as you level up, all these lines generally trend downward. So by the end game, hitting something's moderate saving throw with a grapple only requires a four but in the early game you need a nine and that's kind of a general trend that the athletics maneuvers aren't as great early but they have major spikes and these are the times that you'd get a proficiency bonus because from wrestler you could get it at level two that's what this downward spike is then at level seven you see a downward spike all in sync because that's when your proficiency in athletics goes up to master and then at 15, you get a big spike because that also coincides with your strength increasing by plus one. So this is a much bigger spike than you'd see elsewhere. That's where all the spikes downs are. Everything else just gradually goes up over time. But you can see you're pretty likely to hit people if you're targeting especially weaker saves, even at the lower levels. And of course, this is on level creatures and blah, blah, blah. But you can imagine that even going to boss fights is these mid levels you're gonna be fine if you're just coin flipping based on character design what their weak save is you can pretty frequently get that trip off make them waste an action every round as they stand back up and then maybe take reactive strike from a fighter or something then you go for a grapple against the spellcasters and you can absolutely sauce people especially as your athletic starts to scale up because athletics scales harder than saves do in this game, and very few things are asymmetric scaling. Skills start lower than one would expect, and then end higher than one would expect. Just as a general rule of thumb. And how did I make that chart? Well, I add up the total bonus of what the character would have at each level, and I pulled the saving throw chart from the creature building guidelines. That is also pretty accurate. Most creatures will have saves between like high and moderate at most levels. So if you're guessing for a weaker save, you're probably going to be rolling against this moderate line more than anything else. And I, I say, feel free to do your own math on what the level plus one and whatever do. I'm going to have this uh, entire spreadsheet down in the description below. You can feel free to mess with it. I didn't exactly try to make it organized. I just throw it out there so I get that graph but the point of this character is there are many ways you can approach a fight you have the athletic rush for grapple trip which is good if you have fewer targets because then you can lock down a significant percent of the enemy action economy very easily you can go for the punches for sustained damage you can come camp at range with your damage spells and make them blow up you can play the backline healer with a shield for safety because you have good ac you still have more heals than any other character could. So you're a specialist healer, specialist grappler with this other stuff in the middle. You can throw out area spells at the start of fight to clear out some of the, the little minions. You can use buff and long duration spells to win over time. And heal, make sure that your side will live to the full duration of those spells if they need to. So you can set up all kinds of long duration effects and have that give you value over the course of a harder fight and just be fine with burning a lot of heals because you have the heals to burn. And you can do any combination of these above strategies based on turn by turn what you want to do. And I should also mention, you have all the fear-based debuffs. You have fine debuffs. 
So you can really shift the math of this game. And let's quickly talk about feats beyond level one, because this is a guide and it'd be kind of sucky if I just left you with level one. So I recommend Wrestler Dedication. It does come from Grand Bazaar. So if you want to play this in PFS, you will need the Grand Bazaar supplement. And I've made many videos on the Wrestler archetype. I'm just going to go over it one more time here. I'm probably going to have a link to the guide that shows up um, here on screen. I'm probably going to have that just being a little eye icon above me. You know, just just look up there. Um, anyway, I might have forgotten, but wrestler dedication, every line text here is relevant. We will meet the prerequisites. You, you just are going to meet them. It, The only one that actually is a requirement that you actively need to build for is trained in athletics because these other two things happen for every class in the game automatically. Um, and it just says that you become an expert in athletics right there at level two. Extra skill increase. Okay, you gain an extra skill feat that we were going to need to take anyway. You don't take a penalty for making a lethal attack with non-lethal unarmed attacks, which is good if you're fighting constructs. In addition, you get a plus two bonus to Fort DC when resisting attempts to grapple you or swallow you whole, which is relevant now that the grab ability got a rework. Every line of text here is actually pretty good. This is on par with a lot of level two class feats. So dedication, good. Combat grab, very good. Because what this does is lets you strike. And then if that strike hits, they become grabbed. You need to have an active multi-attack penalty to use it, but that means you can run up with athletic rush, trip. And if you think they have a high fort, you go for the combat grab. You can't crit fail a combat grab. You can't crit fail a combat grab. So you can't knock yourself prone just from whiffing super hard, which is also upside. Let's you target different DC, which is upside. Your strikes aren't going to be that much weaker than martial strikes. You do progress at a slower rate, but you'll have blessed to make up for it. They're going to be off guard to make up for it. So you actually can hit combat grabs pretty consistently as a war priest. And that means you have another DC to target to get your grabs off. So, oh boy, if they have a brute boss, you just trip combat grab every round. And then they have to spend so long getting rid of that prone condition. They're just going to be attacking with minus two. You raise that shield and, oh, look, now I'm at champion level AC and I have all these heal spells. This game has no balance issues of any kind. Um... I'd also recommend picking up Whirling Throw when it becomes available at that level 8 mark. Because this one actually does not require an unarmed strike roll. It's an athletics check. And you know how I feel about athletics checks. And when you grab somebody, they aren't released till the end of your next turn. So you can try and do the combat grab thing. And if it doesn't work out, you then Whirling Throw them away. And make them spend actions coming back to you. If they were pro at the start of the Whirling Throw, they're still... It's great. It does good damage, no attack trait, and you can have it be for right before you'd have to release a grab anyway. If you're on a boat, you can use this to throw people off the boat. Great time. Love whirling throw. Other wrestler feats are more in the category of nice to have. That's where stuff like suplex comes in. I'm not going to go too into detail on other wrestler feats because, well, guess what? I have a 50 minute guide on the topic already, so I'm not going to repeat myself too much here. Um, just know that the abilities that call for an unarmed strike will be slightly weaker. The abilities that call for a skill check will be slightly stronger. And basically after that, all my ratings are accurate. So for the core build, the identity is the grapple trip. That's kind of what I did for Donsbury Days. And they don't even have Remaster Cleric in that game. So I was just running in with the grand strategy of well i'm gonna play grapple cleric anyway despite they're not being my domain despite they're not being a fist deity i'm still gonna grapple cleric my way through this game and i use that cleric because well having one character to trip in a group of a bunch of martial characters to beat the crap out of them is pretty nice and it also gives me a way to fit a healer on the speedrun comps it's it's pretty good you don't need wrestler for this play style to be good it just makes it better it gives you a ton of healing. And this is the type of character that you bring to a party. And the only healing other characters need to have 
is an elixir of life for in case you get knocked out. That's all they need. Because then you just heal yourself and then you step out of the fight. And you just play a backline healer for a bit. Only handful of feats are required. And that's just Athletic Rush, really. The other things can be considered optional. I just highlighted the ones early game that I think make you way stronger than you should be. And there's the list of all the feats and why, but I've already talked about these in other sections, so I'm not going to repeat myself here. Take a screenshot if you want a, a decent justification. Other directions. Spin the wheel on cleric feats that you have room to take. Um... Pretty much all of the cleric feats are at least good. Some might be more campaign dependents. Others are more generally useful. I'm going to highlight a few that I like here. The armor feat is nice, but it's not 100% necessary. Five move speed is five move speed. Fleet is one of the best feats in the game for a reason. Um, A lot of cleric feats can be situational. I can't say this cleric feat is clearly going to be best for this build because a lot of the cleric feats are about what type of situation they work against. So depending on what campaign you're playing, different feats are going to be better. So options. Divine Castigation, really nice for your living party and you're fighting sworn enemies. So if you're going to be fighting demons or angels in your campaign, I'd windmill slam this one. It's going to be great. Healing Hands. Um... If you're using a lot of three action heals, this is going to be a significant percentage output. It's basically like you get plus 20% more healing on the three action heal. For the two action variant, which is what I said the most commonly used one is, it isn't that significant of a percent. It's closer to mental math around like 8%-ish, that kind of ballpark, which is still an improvement, but it's not like, you know, going to make or break a lot of fights. It's just nice to have. I think Reach Spell can make or break a fight more often because it lets you position differently when you're doing things like Runic Weaponing and when you're doing things like that two-action heal and you don't want to approach for some reason. I, I, I have seen situations where you get knocked prone and the character just keeps on Reach Spelling in their heals in order to affect the fight. So I like Reach Spell a lot. I know others aren't as high up on reach spell but i like it a lot yeah you have versatile thought because you know if rory does have that harm as an option and that can then let you use channel smite and other things to improve your burst damage output because you can build this character to also have a little bit of burst damage potential i just don't think it's as good as just going all in for the trip but that is a way you can have even more options for this character there's also Restorative Strike, which is like the healing version of that one. It's There are a lot of options. Divine Rebuttal is great if your GM likes to use a lot of spell casty type creatures. And they decide to ignore you. You then have Wabam Punch. And it could let your allies get a bonus to their save, which is kind of funny. Uh, clerics have a hard time getting reactions. So, you know, this one's a fine reaction to get. Because against martial enemies, you might want to shield block. Against spellcaster enemies... You then have Divine Rebuttal. Uh, Restorative Channel. I think this one is better than you would originally expect because it basically says all these spells that counteract, you always have the perfect one for the scenario. Um, once per day. But like, that's kind of all you need. It's based on the amount of font slots you have. You're only going to really need it once per day. At most. But... When this does come up, I can imagine the GM's face when you go, oh, oh, oh no, they're blinded. Oh no, uh, oh, it's gone. But you didn't have that spell prepared today. Yeah, no, didn't need to. I just always have it, you know, only when I need it though. Otherwise it's a heal, you know, one of the best, most versatile spells in the game. Yeah, yeah, that spell I have five extra copies of. Yeah, that one. I, uh, I, I'm, I like this. I like this one a lot. Uh, it's fun. And then there's also, of course, you get more focus spells, which gives you more focus points to have more use of athletic rush per fight. Advanced domain can give you a reaction if you have the might domain and blah, 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 blah. Damage resistance helps you be tanky, helps you not die. Good stuff. And Warpreak's armor, which is the 
feat that I've been alluding to that lets you have heavy armor? Am I convinced it's great? Ah, I, 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 I'm not sure how much of a big deal heavy versus medium armor is because I like the move speed a lot. I mean, I'm still probably going to use it. Still probably going to take this. I just don't think it's as mandatory as a lot of people are making it out to be. And I will say you can actually delay wrestler archetype if you want to go medic. It will delay your combat grab by a lot. It's going to delay you're getting expert in athletics by a good amount. But if you're starting at a higher level, um, slamming down into doctor's visitation to have more mobility and having medic dedication give you more battle medicines per day can be pretty damn nice. Uh, I have an example build down the description of how you can do that. And... Yeah, one of the example builds is Pathfinder Society Legal. Another one will be the wrestler with free archetype, just fully. That fits a lot more cleric feats. And then one that will show how you can fit a medic. And they go up to level 8. And I, the reason I'm not going to level 9 plus is that's the second ancestry feat. And I wanted to leave that open for the people that wanted to play the half ancestry, half human, half orcs, or the half human, half whatevers. I wanted to leave that open. So yeah, that's the basic outline of the guide. A lot of the power comes from having a mountain of choices to make and picking the correct one for the situation. Your numbers are good enough to be a specialist in like three different things and also decent at a bunch more things. So then it comes down to player skill of knowing the game and knowing what the fight calls for. And if you are good at thinking through those fights and picking the right option, this character will look ridiculously overpowered but at the same time it only looks ridiculously overpowered if people know what you're doing because newer players they'll look at the giant instinct barbarian and think they're the overpowered one but they're not going to see the one that's letting them hit making sure they're still alive and really you are basically invisible to a lot of table ire because you're helping them you just have the right spell. That's all there is to it. This is a build that will basically always give you the proper option for every scenario. As long as you're playing well, this build will get you to where you need to go. And yeah, absolutely customize these. I'm not claiming to have all of the answers for all the mid-level feats. I just think I have the answer for level one. I think I got that sorted. Um, but from there... Everything is up for debate. So yeah. Build your awesome clerics. And I would suggest make your GM's life just that little bit harder. And Ron, I'm sorry. You're now going to have a Joel Vedd in every one of your parties. I am so sorry. But not really. I think it's hilarious. So with that, uh, you can feel free to click the subscribe button down below, like, comment, and if you like my videos a lot and you want to help support me uh, go through college and maybe replace my mic because I'm currently relying on tape to hold the power cord in, <laughs> there's the tape, um, you can click the join button down below. It's a $5 per month thing and it'll give you access to all my major Pathfinder guides 24 to 48 hours early before I release it publicly to everybody else. This guide was released on Friday for all the channel members, but won't be released till Saturday for everybody else. So with that, I'm going to sign off. Thank you all for sticking around. Let me know if you have any critiques of this format. I might do more build guides, but these things are actually still quite a bit of work to put together. Um, yeah. There we go.